Um, I'm Mike King. I'm um, Enterprise Sales Director for CCSI. Uh, and, today, and today we have uh, presenting with us Krista House, System Engineer, uh, System Engineer Manager with Silver Peak, and Livia Feinbaum, uh, Principal uh, Sales Engineer at uh, Netscope. Um, can you guys hear me, Chris and uh, Livius? Loud and clear. Fantastic. Yep. Great. So be before we get launched into the actual technical presentation, I just want to give everybody, uh, especially uh, some of the new people that are uh, on the seminar that are not that familiar with uh, CCSI, a little quick overview of uh, CCSI, our solutions, and some of the focus areas uh, that we um, are, you know, that we're focusing on. So well, CCSI is, is kind of unique. There's one of the one of the few resellers that have been around for you know 44 years. So we started in the mainframe business. Uh, a couple of engineers got together to put together some services, um, and it, you know it, it grew into uh, distributed computing, uh, right out to where we are today in, in cloud and SD WAN and all the uh, next generation uh, technologies that uh, that are offered today. We're we're a full um, Long Island based. Uh, full solutions and service providers, so we're an MSP and an MSFP, uh, about 120 employees, probably hitting close to 50 million in sales, um, in-house in engineers, uh, about 70 strong, so most of, the, most of our employees are engineers. We do a lot of um, you know, field work, implementations, um, a whole bunch of stuff in that area. Uh, we also have a whole bunch, uh, we, we have, you know, security, cloud, and hyper-converged technology specialists that focus in on the special uh, solutions that we offer. Um, out of Bohemia here, we do, uh, we do full staging and testing of systems for, for our customers. Um, we have a full POC lab where you can actually simulate the uh, Netscope and the, and the Silver Peak solutions. You look for jitter, look for latency, and simulate uh, your network in, in a virtual environment. Um, and then we, we house our uh, 7 by 24 NOC uh, out of Bohemia as well, or NOC in our SOC. Um, so one of, one of the things that I think you're going to hear in this presentation and that we're, what we're pushing uh, in the field is, you know, simplification. And a lot of the new technologies, um, SD-WAN specifically, uh, drives down, you know, IT cost and complexity, uh, and people are looking for more simplified uh, solutions in, in the marketplace. You know, from, from a, a, a CCSI perspective, we have our, our full knock and sock here. We do a lot of cloud-based services for DRAS, um, backup as a service. We have a new solution coming out um, in about uh, next quarter for cloud visibility as a service, and then full cloud migration services. So full security offering, um, Wi-Fi, SD-WAN, um, all, all from one company, including implementation and, and um, uh, installation. The other area that we're very strong in is, is security and compliance. So if you're in the financial field, NYDFS is, is a big offering that we offer. So compliance, meeting um, risk and uh, ransomware assessments, uh, we do DDoS simulation. All these uh, services are uh, performed by highly uh, certified engineers um, and, and, you know, pretty much be done on a daily basis. One of, the, one of the unique things about us is that we are a NOC. We, we, are, we have a full-fledged uh, SOC 2 compliant SOC and, uh, and a full network operations center, you know, uh, supporting SMB accounts right up from SMB to Honeywell. Uh, so it's, it's headquartered out of here in, um, in Bohemia, uh, fully staffed with CCSI employees um, and 24 by 7 service. And just to give you um, an idea, uh, of some of the more recent awards for 2017 into 2018. We just won Elite 250 uh, for, from CRN uh, for 2018, so we're uh, very excited about that. Um, at, the end of, at the end of the uh, de uh, presentation, we're going to do some Q&A, uh, and then we'll update you on that. I'm going to pass this off to Chris. You're up first, and thank you for joining today. Thanks, Mike. All right. Yes. Yeah, I, need it. I can do it. I will okay. take it away. You don't trust me? <laughs> All right. You guys should see traditional WAN not designed for the cloud. Is that right? Yep, I see it. Great, thanks. So uh, uh, this is Chris Tast. I run systems engineering on the east for Silver Peak. Um, that's basically uh, Toronto down to Florida. 
And uh, I'm going to walk through probably a quick 10 minutes, maybe even more, more 15, um, a, a focus point of, of what Silver Peak does, and uh, particularly in the security space, which uh, coincides nicely with Mike just uh, led us into. So I uh, think first things first is um, let's just talk about the market a little bit. It's a good way to start, uh, make sure everybody kind of nods their head in the same direction. Uh, the most important thing to take away um, at the very beginning is that things aren't going to continue working the same way they've worked for years in the past. You know, Mike started out by saying that in, in 74, CCI, CCSI Net was, was working on mainframes, and mainframes lasted for a long time, and then they went away, and now they, they kind of lurk back and have been reborn. In, in some sense, um, with, with cloud services. So uh, the point is that, you know, in IT, everything changes. And one thing that hasn't changed in a very long time is the wide area network. And that's mostly because it's a complicated thing to change. What a WAN does is connect an enterprise across a variety of, of technologies, a variety of locations, some global. Um, it requires very frequently or almost exclusively third parties to provide that connectivity. So the impetus for change is is there, but it's slow. And it's slow because when you don't have control over something, it, it's really hard to um, to change it, for lack of a better way of putting it. Um, if you have a third party controlling your connectivity um, almost exclusively, then it's very hard to move away from that paradigm. But those days are slowly coming to an end. Um, the current way things have been built over what you could say is MPLS networks or VPN networks uh, has been lasted, it was lasted for about 15, maybe you could say 20 years, depending on how you want to count. And um, it's right for change, and, and that's where Silver Peak and quite a few other companies are really trying to build out a, a practice and that, that effectively um, is going to augment the way customers are doing things today and eventually completely lead to a wholesale new type of connectivity. So that's the lead-in, um, and the point is, you know, in, in that long-winded way of saying is that, you know, the traditional WAN, the, the wide area network, is not designed for the cloud. It's not even designed for um, effective connectivity, but particularly it's not designed for the cloud. Yet, if you look at what enterprises are doing, the vast majority, as you can see by the percentages on the screen, are finding their way um, into the cloud, either via SaaS applications that we all know, um, or via infrastructure as a service hosted in the cloud, maybe you have a hybrid cloud cloud platform, um, and that that shift of where your applications are being housed creates two things. One, it creates a connectivity issue because traditional wide area networks do not work in a way that easily connects to the cloud. A lot of them backhaul, and if they don't backhaul, they have a, another complexity. We'll get to that in a second. Um, but at the same time, um, the connections at a branch are going to usually have an MPLS component and a network internet component that's going to let you get out to the cloud, but might have a security posture that complicates that process. And then finally, um, as you can see towards the end, which is getting towards a bit of why we think things are going to change, the legacy design that's been around for so long, um, the network and the routing components and the, the actual connectivity that's on the edge uh, is, is starting to refresh. And this new technology based on Gartner and, and Cisco Cloud Index and a few other things is really pointing to the refresh is not going to be a refresh of old. It's going to be a rebuild of new. So that's the idea. You know, the, the network is changing. It wasn't designed to handle uh, the type of workloads and the, the pathing that, that's required for effective enterprise communication. That's only going to continue to happen. And um, based on everything the industry has seen, it's, it's ripe for change, and we're starting to see that change with software to find when. And I'm supposed to go to the next slide, but it didn't want to. So let's see if I can force that. Do, do, do. How about you? There we go. Cool. So um, I really ran through this already, but I'm going to sort of recap it. Um, so what are the current LUAN challenges? We know things are changing. Um, what's, what's driving the change beyond just, um, you know, timing, so to speak? Um, well, one, like I said, there is an increasing need for cloud applications to be supported um, without um, – with, with consistency, but also with a cost-effective approach. Um, then there is the complexity that's being driven in by these existing infrastructures, um, which stands completely against the simplicity that, that software as a service in a cloud environment is supposed to provide you. And then um, along those lines, and you can kind of read between it, is that at all those points, the security 
posture or the security position that a company is going to have when users are now accessing things that are no longer on premises um, in terms of critical documentation or critical business applications, um, as well as the need to have that um, be universally accessible, like I, I want to be able to access it from my office and my home as well as when I'm, you know, on the road or in an airport. Um, and security posture stands against a lot of that. I mean, traditional security is to lock things down very effectively, and you lock it down by minimizing the, um, the exposure area that you would give to potential attackers. And when you start talking about putting everything in the cloud, well, that seems like a lot of exposure. So the idea that you have this need for the support and the complexity is, is making it more difficult stands directly in the face of um, simplicity, and the security only complicates that, or the need for security only complicates that. At all these points, you know, you hear the word automation said day in and day out, and there's a real lack of it in the legacy technology. And obviously, if you start tearing all this together and, you know, painting a picture of what it looks like from an operational or capital expenditure point, you can imagine that it's going to cost a lot of money. Uh, I'm going to create new ways of hosting my applications, but I'm going to use legacy technologies, and I'm constantly going to shim in solutions, which will be uh, ineffective um, on all these fronts, on all these bullets. So not only am I I'm losing um, the flexibility and you know having security questions and um, working in a different world but I'm spending more to do it so it's a very um, problematic set of, of, um, of scenarios in front of you and they get worse and worse exponentially as you keep adding you know a new little bullet so to speak so obviously I'm going to come here and tell you that there's there's other ways to look at it, but you know the first and the, the the focus that I'm going to spend my time on is not all the things we do around software defined WAN and connecting multiple sites over broadband or everything else like that. What I'm actually going to spend the time focused on is um, what does it look like today, even if you are looking at an SD WAN um, technology, what can uh, or how do we look at it as Silver Peak um, from a what's the best way to approach this problem and um, what you might gain out of doing that. So uh, the first thing is um, we talked about, or I mentioned, um, software as a service is really uh, prevalent, and we're going to focus on that. You know that a lot of my applications, critical business applications, whether I am a B2B or I'm working directly with customers and I'm an individual, um, in all those scenarios, my applications, my critical applications, are predominantly finding their way into cloud architectures. Simple as that. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. It's just the way the world is going these days. Um, for a variety of reasons. Now, you can classify um, those apps or bucket those apps in different ways, but uh, that's, that's sort of the, the whole way that you're going to talk about the security posture is that I want to be able to allow my um, applications to that are in the cloud to be locally accessed the same way I do when I'm at my house. I want to be able to reach them quickly. And in a legacy model, or even in some of these SD-WAN models that we see today, it's really all or nothing. I'm either going to say everybody can go out to the internet, or no one can go out to the internet unless you go see one of my nice firewalls either at the data center or either on, on premise. Now, the all or nothing, the binary nature of it, um, while it's effective to some degree, creates a problem because while the internet is good for hosting these great applications in, in the cloud, so to speak, there's also a bunch of things out in the internet that you naturally don't want your end users getting to. So you can put a high-end firewall, let's say, at a branch, or you can create a policy that forces everything back to a data center. But what you really want to do if you think about it, is be selective. You want to have buckets of applications, gray-listed, white-listed, black-listed, that are able to leak out locally if they match certain profiles. That is a key going forward concept to take, that if I'm going to be reaching out to these SaaS applications, I want to be selective about which ones I reach, and I want to lock down or control everything else, whether I'm at home or whether I'm at the office, you know, the concept is gonna say the same. And that, you know, a really effective um, software-defined wide area networking strategy will allow you to selectively and dynamically um, control applications, split tunneling, so to speak, out from a branch. And that's the key point right there. You want to be able to 
allow particular applications out and lock down the rest the way the firewall could. But with the changes in software defined, excuse me, software as a service in the cloud, it's not as easy as just a on or off switch. You have to start doing things at a sort of a DPI level. So let's talk about how we look at it as a company. So <clears throat> the first thing you have to realize is um, understanding an application in, on the cloud is not like anything else. You need to actually look at the URL. You need to understand what the traffic is potentially going to. You need to have a back-end um, dictionary, so to speak, to reference. You need a lot of information to make a decision about what a packet on the very first connection, the very first pass um, is. Because if you don't catch it on the very first packet, you're actually going to be in a scenario where they're either you're back to the all or nothing, the back call or not back call. So what can you take away from this? Well, that first packet is critical. You need to be able to see traffic traverse the box and decide immediately whether this is a trusted business application, whether this is something I might send out to a secure web gateway if I were using one, or whether this is in my untrusted or gray listed or even blacklisted. And you want to do that on the first pass. The reason that that first pass is so important is because the application profiles and the definitions themselves are not static. Everything is dynamic. That's the beauty of the cloud in the first place, but that's also the problem with it. So as you look at how you want to split out traffic, as you look at how you want to integrate um, SaaS applications uh, into your enterprise, and as you then also look at how you want to um, control traffic to those applications, the most important thing you can take away is that it has to be done effectively on the very first pass, and that means the very first packet. So. When we went in and as an organization, as a company, looked at how to approach this, we, we saw the problem. We saw the nature of the problem being it's got to be on that first shot, that very first packet, um, if it's going to be effective. And we spent a lot of time and a lot of IP um, and a lot of engineering resources to work on building something that we think is very effective in this space. So when a packet comes to a Silver Peak appliance, which is called an Edge Connect, um, and it's destined for, for potential um, breakout, the the initial connection as it's being stood up will be looked at and we'll say, oh, this is a nice trusted group. I can send that out directly to net. It can take the fastest route over the internet to those particular applications. And you can look in that box in the green and say, ah, oh, yes, those are logical. I would want, you know, if it's an Office 365 application or Salesforce or AWS or Azure, et cetera, I want that to leave immediately. I trust the SaaS um, organization and I, um, know that that's an application that's critical to, the business, critical to the business. Then there's this other group of applications which are actually very important to enterprises in various ways. You can call them home from work apps where, you know, YouTube or LinkedIn or Facebook or Google or um, other components which are critical to business potentially or just user, you know, and, and employees being happy, um, I still want to leak those out locally. I don't want to have to use a high-end firewall to control them, um, but I would then in that case maybe split that out to a secure web gateway. Again, on the very first packet, being able to catch that becomes critical. And then finally is, well, if you don't match those first two buckets, everybody go back to the big heavy-duty firewall I have in the data center. So this holistic approach by catching two packets on the first pass um, and being able to Strafe the traffic based on the bucket applies to becomes critical to the way that you're going to keep users happy and a business and organization running effectively. All right. So um, in all of that, uh, I'm sure it sounds very cool and a little bit of hand wavy, but the truth is that, you know, it's, it's critical to the way that your organizations will run. Um, and if you go along with that idea, the next question you're going to have, well, how easy is that to do? Um, we spend a lot of time trying to simplify and automate the way this connectivity works. You know, it's very easy for me to come up and say, hey, this is how it should work. But then if I can't show you a simple way of doing it, you're back to spending a lot. You're back to high operational expenditures. You're ha back to having to learn a new technology. You're trying to daisy chain a bunch of technologies together potentially. You don't want to have that happen. What you want it to do is be simple application-centric driven and basically a um, build once, deploy many kind of thing. And what we do for that is we really go towards an orchestrator. I know the term is single pane of glass. I was never a fan of it. But candidly, this orchestrator, which is a centralized manager, allows you to build these policies once, apply across the board, and then have them maintained and modified as you're going through. So a critical thing to take away out of all this, not only is that this splitting out of the traffic intelligently on the first packet is critical, but also that it has to be easy. And we have a very 
very strong and attractive solution in that space simply because we've been around for a while and we had to build an orchestration tool to manage, you know, hundreds upon thousands of sites. Um, it becomes critical that it's a build once deployed many. We have an orchestration engine that's built to do that. So um, the last slide um, is just sort of how we talk about it when I'm, I'm in front of customers and what I think are the key points to take away. So this is going to step back more into the, away from the, uh, the SaaS side and more towards how Silver Peak looks at security holistically. And the first thing we do is, you know, security in the future, currently and in the future, is going to be a lot about micro-segmentation. And we believe on, po on policing and controlling that and following those policies from the edge all the way back to the data center, from the user all the way back to the server. So micro-segmentation is something that's built into the solution, and we believe it's critical. At the same time, the high-level security, don't want to be hacked. That's just sort of native. Um, but again, getting back to these these two points here at the bottom, which I spent a lot of time talking about before, is the way that your firewalls will work, the way that you're going to service chain these, te these type of um, traffic patterns into the appropriate technology in the cloud, that's really where all the, the technology and the thought um, leadership will take us. It's, it's being able to look at an application, understand the nature of the app, decide how it should be released out into the wild, so to speak, how it should be scanned, what type of services and software technologies we chain that to, and then go from there. So this is really the foundation. It's, it's a four bullet setup, but really what it comes down to is segmentation is key, understanding the application is key, being able to make an intelligent decision on where to send that application immediately on the first shot, it turns out to be one of the most critical features you'll see going forward. So that's it. Uh, I don't want to spend too much time. I know we're already at uh, 25 after, so I will pass it off. I believe we'll take questions at the end, so I'll pass it off now. Um, and we'll go on to the next presenter. Great, and, and anybody that has questions for, um, at the end, you can uh, submit your questions through the chat. Great, thank you, Mike. Um, this is Livia Spinebaum, uh, Principal Sales Engineer from Netscope in the uh, New York metro area. And uh, I really appreciate the uh, uh, going after Chris from Silver Beak because he framed it very nicely. Uh, about accessing uh, those trusted business apps uh, at Netscope. We will uh, refer to those as sanctioned apps or, or uh, enterprise IT-led apps. And uh, I think over the next few slides, we'll, we'll put a, a framework around uh, the considerations, the security and compliance considerations of enterprises adopting um, these, uh, these sanctioned apps uh, and beyond. So, Let's, let's talk about where we were previously. Uh, originally, all apps and all enterprise data was uh, inside the perimeter, was inside the data center. Uh, central uh, IT managed all the access, all the storage. Um, remote uses was uh, required a justification, uh, required, if you will, uh, you know, sign-offs and then uh, provisioning and, and uh, was more tightly monitored. And uh, threats were considered to be outside, so uh, a, a tough exterior shell, if you will, uh, preventing uh, whether it was volumetric or whether it was an advanced persistent threat. This was all considered to be, you know, a clear uh, wall around the castle. Um, but things have changed, and today, uh, we're in a completely different paradigm. Uh, business decides where data is created, where data is stored. Uh, various different organizations within an enterprise will uh, optimize their business process by uh, buying licenses, however many they need, and uh, paying with a credit card or and doing an expense process. And uh, if the business processes uh, related to sensitive data, then that data is now uh, stored outside of the data center, stored actually on a third party server. Um, uh, we know that, uh, you know, web is widely connected. Uh, the, the, uh, the cloud apps themselves are, are widely accessible. I think Chris made that reference. You know, I want to be able to access from my office, from Starbucks uh, while I'm traveling. 
So uh, with all of the smart devices that are in our pockets and briefcases and, and uh, full-fledged laptops, really work is done from anywhere now. Um, it is an expected uh, scenario where you have remote access. Um, and uh, with, the, uh, with, with this emergence of uh, apps no longer being inside the data center but uh, out in, in the wild, if you will, uh, these uh, public SaaS apps, and including the unmanaged apps, apps that uh, enterprise IT does not have uh, controls over or administrative credentials to, um, these apps become vectors for uh, malware, for, for external threats getting in. So it's now uh, quite an intermingled uh, model, if you will. These are the present day changes. Um, uh, exfiltration concerns about malware, uh, uh, concerns about managed devices versus unmanaged devices, um, uh, corporate data, uh, it should it, does policy permit that corporate data uh, should be allowed to uh, end up getting downloaded on that device? It's not managed by the enterprise. Well, there may be uh, different caveats to, that you want to implement in a policy. And of course, uh, we're humans. We, we uh, have a challenge with managing uh, the proliferation, the explosion of, of password accounts or accounts that we need to manage. So uh, it's not uncommon that humans will reuse uh, account credentials and even account passwords, exposing further the, uh, the risk, if you will, of a, a corporate uh, password that grants access to an internal domain uh, if it's reused for uh, a service that has suffered a breach, uh, that account credential uh, could potentially be found in a, a dark web, a paste bin. Now that's another uh, risk vector that needs to be considered by the enterprise uh, risk holders, uh, stakeholders. So what's needed here, the, the solution around securing uh, corporate data uh, and the usage of cloud apps is a, a framework, a, a, a policy enforcement uh, model that considers all the different kinds of uh, data access and data sensitivity. Just, just to name a few, uh, I, I think the concept of uh, creating a public link to a file in a, a cloud storage service, or uh, for example, we, we've seen a number of uh, reports about the public links to S3 buckets in, in, uh, in Amazon Web Services and, and then the, the results of such things being discovered. Um, access, for example, I mentioned uh, employees uh, obviously will be working from managed devices or endpoints uh, during the business day when they're at their office, uh, but they may also be uh, using the same account the, the use to, to log into Office 365 during the day. On the weekend, uh, away on vacation, they may be using uh, an unmanaged device, a personal device. Those are uh, access models that we need to consider. Um, internal risks such as uh, theft of data, uh, someone uh, using a managed device, corporate uh, issue, uh, connects to the, the, the corporate instance of Salesforce, for example and uh, downloads content sensitive uh, customer list information from uh, your, your CRM system, then from that same device may not be prevented from attaching that as a file, that data, to uh, a Yahoo webmail uh, or maybe via a LinkedIn message, for example. Uh, and, and then from an external uh, risk point of view, uh, Netscope uh, maintains a uh, cloud threat research uh, team focused specifically on uh, malware and threats that, that uh, leverage cloud vectors. So uh, whether it's uh, employees using their corporate instance of, let's say, Box, so there's an inherent trust because it's IT-led, IT-managed, and uh, so the content there should be uh, more trustworthy and yet through uh, various access uh, paradigms I, I mentioned earlier, 
Um, it is entirely possible that a uh, malicious payload can find its way into a piece of content that is in the trusted corporate instance of a, uh, a cloud app, a cloud service provider app. So uh, downloading that file onto a managed device, and now you have a, you know, an infiltration, for example. So what's really needed is, is a, a cloud-based access control policy framework that is aware of all of these uh, criteria. It's the user, it's the device type, it's the location, um, it's the content. Are we talking about uh, uh, sensitive data like PII or GDPR or HIPAA? Um, are we talking about content that is carrying uh, potentially, uh, unbeknownst to either party, uh, malicious payload? So a, a policy framework that, that can uh, take into consideration the sensitivity of data in addition to the other uh, criteria I just mentioned. Another consideration is this difference between uh, IT-led apps, uh, which is actually the smaller number of the apps in use by business at any given time. Um, whereas uh, you may consider uh, an Office 365 deployment or, or a Box deployment. The, these, were, these are typical apps you'll find that in a broader a uh, broader part of the workforce will be consuming these apps and these will be centrally managed and the, the CISO uh, is able to log in and inspect every user, every piece of content, every uh, activity for, from an audit perspective. But the, uh, we find in our research that the number of apps uh, an ag average enterprise has is around 1,000. And the overwhelming majority of the apps discovered to be in use, in other words, users transacting data with those apps, uh, are not centrally managed. They are often business-led, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, they are uh, often consumer-grade apps. Um, many, most of the apps that are consumed do not expose uh, public APIs. Uh, which would, uh, which is one of the methods of controlling an app. The, the, the managed, the, the sanctioned apps, for example, like a Box or a Salesforce or a Google Suite, uh, they p publish well-known APIs, and then uh, these APIs can be used to, to manage content, to manage user activities, uh, to secure content. But uh, the overwhelming number of apps in use, uh, in fact, don't offer uh, these APIs. And yet blocking, uh, just flat out blocking access to uh, these unsanctioned apps uh, is not an option uh, given that these are apps that actually run uh, the business, the business process in, uh, in the various departments and organizations of an enterprise. So uh, th these are some of the realities that, that exist in every single enterprise. And this is the problem that Netscope was built from the ground up to solve, to cover uh, the full spectrum of apps, those that are centrally manageable and perhaps already managed, as well as those that are not manageable and therefore uh, not currently managed. Um, I return to this, this uh, cloud policy framework. Um, and, and, uh, to, to drill into the uh, individual criteria that, that really are, are needed to impose corporate policies. Let, let, let's think of use cases here. Let's think of a case where um, uh, Mary Marketing is, uh, by, by the nature of the group that she works for, um, she is uh, permitted to access, uh, let's say, uh, LinkedIn, and Twitter and Facebook, so social media apps to maintain brand presence. So uh, the policy uh, should permit her to, to access and to maintain the brand presence. However, she should uh, there should be controls in place 
to uh, restrict what kind of content or updates uh, uh, this uh, individual is allowed to, to make to this cloud service. Um, should Mary be allowed to upload a, a piece of uh, content that contains 300 records of PII to, uh, to Facebook? Um, and we don't expect that she would do that, but the control is, is uh, relevant. It makes sense to, to actually have such a control. So to understand uh, the, the language of these uh, modern cloud apps, such as uh, uh, uploading or the, uh, the opportunity to share, like sending a link to a, a, an external party, or sending a link to a, a consumer-grade email address, or, or generating a public link, or posting of 140 characters to to Twitter, or, or sending messages via LinkedIn, um, or webmails. Uh, sending the, the body the, the body of a webmail is a, a data container, and, and uh, the content can be uh, copied from uh, a document that, that is internal to an enterprise. Paste that text can be pasted into the body of a webmail. And then uh, that webmail can be sent out to anyone, uh, any email address that, that, that's uh, valid. So the ability to craft policy around users, including groups and or organizational units that are associated with those user accounts, the ability to craft policy around uh, location of a user, um, a, a GDPR example I sometimes have given is uh, when my feet are on German soil uh, and I'm uh, establishing a connection with my Google Drive account, um, if I am trying to upload uh, personal data uh, to Google Drive, the policy should prevent me from uploading to a data center that's outside the German borders. That would keep me in compliance with the uh, German Works Council laws, for example. Um, the, the device type. Uh, is the device managed? Is the device uh, unmanaged? Unmanaged examples could be uh, a home uh, office PC, a personal uh, iPad, uh, contractors, vendors, suppliers who are authorized to access the corporate instance of OneDrive or Salesforce as part of the business process. When those third parties are, are making those kinds of access, um, they're using devices that the enterprise does it manage? Generally, that is that is the true statement. They're providing a value-add service to the enterprise, but uh, on their own endpoints. Um, the, the 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 Salesforce example that I just gave, or the 365 example that I just gave, those are two examples of cloud apps that are multi-tenant. So uh, the, the common example is uh, the Coke instance of Pop of Box and the Pepsi instance of Box. So, so uh, the, the, these two instances, uh, they should never cross-pollinate. They should not be one should not be able to access the other. And, and the, the CSPs, the cloud service providers, do a very good job of, of maintaining those tenant walls, those boundaries. Uh, a cloud policy framework that uh, you, you want to be able to craft uh, your, your enterprise policies around should be, needs to be, instance aware of the, the, the tenant wall in 365 versus box versus you, know, the, you pick your favorite cloud app. So uh, a use case is uh, customers have requested, I want to permit logins to the corporate instance of 365 from my uh, trusted sites and managed devices, but I want to prevent logins to uh, thir uh, third party instances or personal instances of those cloud apps. Um, this cloud policy framework also needs to be familiar with or understand the language, we call it the language of the cloud. If I take it down a layer, it is uh, the APIs, the web APIs that are implemented behind the web apps that run in our browsers and the web apps that run uh, from the, the mobile apps we have on our phones uh, and the sync clients that we run on our desktops. 
and, and, and these APIs are, are, are uh, implementing these, I call them data movements, uh, I think of them as data movements, Netscope calls them activities. So I made reference to sharing of files, uploading of files, posting of messages, sending of webmails. It's the verbs, if you will, the, the, those, those activities that users click on and then something happens to uh, data. It's an access control or a data movement, typically. Uh, a policy framework that has this kind of capability can impose uh, a policy such as uh, we, as a corporation, as an enterprise, we permit the use of sharing via Microsoft OneDrive. However, if the intended recipient is a consumer-grade email address, uh, someone at yahoo.com, someone at gmail.com, for example, no, we want the, the policy to prevent the sharing. Or maybe if the intended recipient is on a blacklisted domain, a list of blacklisted domains, we want to prevent that sharing attempt. So the cloud policy framework is uh, very important to be able to speak that language of the cloud. And then finally, um, the content classification. Uh, is it GDPR? Is it PII? Is it PHI? Uh, or is it innocuous? Is, is it, uh, you know, uh, kids, uh, uh, pictures, kids, or, or weekend photos, or, or uh, you know, personal information? Not PII, but, uh, you know, non-corporate non violation. So, so all of these uh, points, all of these criteria make up what Netscope calls uh, Cloud XD for extreme definition. Uh, we, we, in the, the Netscope policy framework, uh, each and every one of these criteria and more can be specified in crafting your, your enterprise corporate policies uh, for fine-grained controls uh, of working with the, the, the software as a service cloud uh, service provider apps. Comparatively speaking, the uh, existing uh, implementations, the, 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 the you know, well-known perimeter implementations that have been uh, deployed in production for uh, half a decade, a decade longer. Um, they, they do fit some of these criteria, but not all of these criteria. Uh, some of these uh, existing implementations are making strides. They, they're, there's evolution that's happening in, in these implementations. Um, what we like to call attention to is that Netscope is built from the ground up, cloud native for cloud activity controls. So I'm going to close with uh, kind of an overview of how um, an enterprise typically approaches getting uh, visibility and controls around uh, SaaS cloud apps, be they managed or unmanaged. And the first step is really to discover uh, what are all of the apps that are being consumed, um, whether they are managed or unmanaged, and that typically is an analysis of uh, egress logs, uh, perimeter logs from a firewall or a proxy. And that, that, is, that data is uh, correlated with uh, a risk analysis. Uh, Netscope maintains a dedicated team that does uh, a, a, an assessment, a vendor assessment, if you will, of currently over 25,000 uh, cloud apps. And so uh, there, there's a variety of uh, risk uh, reporting and the prioritization that can be done just at this phase. Um, commonly, the second phase is to then uh, put in controls, uh, many of which I, I've made reference to in terms of enterprise policies, uh, put in controls around those corporate uh, IT-led or sanctioned apps, leveraging uh, any or all of those criteria that I, I showed on the earlier slide, uh, whether it's access controls, whether it's uh, data loss prevention, so the, I like to call it the inside out problem, data leakage, uh, whether it's threat prevention, uh, having made reference to our uh, uh, malware detection, uh, zero day detection, and cloud sandbox controls, for example. Um, placing these kinds of controls, including uh, encryption 
uh, for, uh, for uh, it's available for sensitive data, and that can be even done with customer managed keys. So the, these kinds of uh, controls can be uh, crafted into corporate policies and enterprise policies and implemented as a cloud policy enforcement framework. Finally, after we've done the discovery um, and we've uh, uh, put in necessary controls for those uh, IT-led or sanctioned apps, it, it, it turns out, if we remember from a couple of slides ago, the overwhelming majority of apps that are being used are not IT-managed. They're, they're, they're not, uh, the, the CISO can't log in and inspect all the content and all the users. And yet these apps are being used, and yet enterprise data is being transacted with these apps. And that data could be sensitive. Marketing could be using a, a cloud app to uh, uh, prepare for a, a marketing campaign in the future. So future plans are out in an unmanaged app. This, this would be a, a use case to, 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 to uh, necessitate uh, putting controls around uh, whether that app is uh, too risky or, or within a risk tolerance. Um, whether the usage of that app is subject to some uh, compliance uh, framework, some regulatory framework. And so this, this really is the uh, third phase of the, uh, the, the cloud uh, journey, as, as we refer to it within Netscope, about getting controls and getting visibility around uh, cloud apps, be they sanctioned or unsanctioned. So uh, this is the you know, final mark slide, but we think of uh, uh, the cloud as uh, uh, an area that needs uh, smart cloud security, and Netscope is that smart cloud security. Thank you. Okay, great. Great information. Thanks, Livius. Thanks, Chris. We actually, we actually have a few questions uh, for both of you guys that came in through the chat. Um, there's a hope. There's, uh, uh, Chris, this one is for you. This would be the first one. The, except, it looks like the concern by using broadband um, in, in replacement of uh, MPLS and uh, or real-time protocols. How do you solve for that for congestion and quality of the packets? Sure, sure. Um, so Silver Peak's uniquely positioned in that space to handle real-time traffic. Um, I won't go into the ones and zeros about exactly how it does it, but uh, the two main things that you can take away with using broadband as opposed to MPLS with real-time traffic that Silver Peak brings to the table uh, is one, it actually monitors the link in real time using the data packets themselves. So the first thing you have to do is figure out there's a problem with the path. If you're going to legitimize broadband as a transport mechanism, you need to make sure that it, it will work um, and that if it's up and available, that it's of a sufficient quality. So we use real time measurements. We don't use a ping or a pole. We don't send any type of um, monitoring down the pipe intentionally. If the pipe is active, we have data on it. We use the data packets themselves. So I can tell in real time whether a packet or a path is seeing latency, loss, or jitter. Great. So now you know how I can see it in real time. Um, the next thing we do, and the other part of that, is I need to um, address that. And Silver Peak addresses that in two ways. Uh, the first thing it does is it creates a um, packet um, well, you could call it a RAID packet, or it's called forward error correction, or path conditioning. But the end result of what I'm talking about, without getting into the technical depths, is I have the ability to pave the path to make the um, the actual broadband connection operate at a higher quality because I inject parity packets on that path. So the example is really simple. Imagine you have three data packets, and then a, you have a Silver Peak generated packet. That's packet number four. That's parity. So what happens when packet number two vanishes? Well, packet one arrives, data packet two is gone, data packet three arrives, and then data packet four um, is actually, a, well, before data packet four arrives, a Silver Peak parity packet shows up, and that parity packet allows loss to be corrected. So the actual function um, of, first we see there's an issue on the line, but I actually can correct a loss on the wire as well in real time. So not only do I see the issue, not only do I correct the issue, but if the issue is so problematic, I actually will then in real time fail the traffic over to a second 
wire or a tertiary wire. So broadband is this legitimate connectivity for real time for me. Um, I can monitor it in real time. If there's a, a slight issue or even a significant issue on the on the path, I can actually pave the path in terms of loss. And then finally, if it's so egregious that I have to get around it in real time, I'll fail the traffic over. To me, broadband is a legitimate transport mechanism for real time, and, and Silver Peak's uniquely positioned to handle it. Great, thanks, thanks. And then, Olivia Field, uh, one of the questions was, um, I have uh, SSL de decryp decryption on my Palo Alto firewalls. Why do I need CASB? Yeah, it's, a, it's an excellent question. Um, I've uh, worked with several enterprises uh, over the last several years who've implemented SSL decrypt, whether it's on Palo Alto or Blue Code or maybe a few others. And uh, they do get the, the you know, clear text uh, access to the transactions. Um, but the, the, the real uh, activity that is uh, going to result in the data movement, the, the sharing uh, activity, if I give that example, and, and the sharing has uh, some intended recipients, such as uh, I gave examples of the, the consumer-grade email or maybe a, a whitelisted uh, business partner with whom it's within uh, policy to share, or maybe a, a blacklisted domain a competitor uh, who, who is uh, out of policy for sharing. So those bits of data are uh, the payload in those transactions that, that uh, the SSL decrypt existing implementations can, can um, they can see that data, but that data needs to be uh, interpreted and then uh, parsed out. And um, the, the engines that, that are uh, required to do that parsing, um, this is where, where Netscope uh, started its uh, differentiation. Um, those web API transactions, particularly the collaborative ones, where you have multiple users that, that could uh, could ultimately benefit from uh, the, the, the collaborative use, collaborative being the share, the send of the webmail, the post of the message. Um, those uh, require a deep, uh, we call it uh, API analysis, and then reveal the results of that analysis to uh, a highly granular policy framework. And uh, the Netsco policy framework uh, it is that framework that, that does that kind of uh, uh, decoding and then exposing so that you can make business policy, business rules around those bits of data. That's the answer to the question uh, why uh, Netscope, if you already have SSL decrypt. I, I would add one additional consideration. The SSL decrypt, uh, whether it's on the Palo or on the Blue Coat, uh, these are uh, in the data center, at the perimeter of the data center. Uh, there is a concept of being able to access from anywhere. Uh, I think uh, Chris even mentioned uh, in his piece, uh, yes, you can backhaul, uh, but uh, at that first packet, uh, these business-led apps, these trusted business apps, uh, you want high performance, you, you, you have trust in place, you want to send them direct to cloud. Uh, all of us as, as uh, knowledge workers have an expectation of direct-to-cloud performance. And so uh, backhaul isn't always, uh, uh, it, it, it's often we find, and we see enterprises eventually find, uh, direct-to-cloud is the way SaaS was built. Um, backhauling for SaaS uh, has brought its challenges to, to enterprises who have tried to uh, put that out there. So a cloud-based uh, policy enforcement framework is really the ideal solution for uh, putting controls around SaaS usage. Okay, great. We're almost done, but we have time for uh, one more question. Uh, this one looks like it's for Chris. Um, it's really, uh, so de deployment options for your solution and mm -hmm. any kind of optimization for cloud applications. Sure. All right. Real quick. Um, it could be deployed, first of all, it's deployed physical or virtual, up to you. It's really a software stack. Um, if you want the physical appliance, great. I got one you can have. It's basically commodity hardware. If you want to run it as a VM on top of infrastructure that already exists, feel free. So same difference to me. Um, it tends to deploy these days as an edge router, a thin edge 
type router replacement. Um, it has enough stateful firewall functionality, zone-based file fun firewall functionality, and routing to replace routers and firewalls um, to a certain degree. I mean, if you're a you know a Fortune 50 bank, it might be a little different, but I think that you can really look at this as a legitimate router replacement for um, a vast majority of your environments. And uh, if if you think about it, it can be deployed as virtual or physical, so it also can be deployed in the cloud. Um, that's just yet another site that I would see as a as a as a um, a point in the environment. So physical or virtual, cloud, all fine. Um, good place to put it is the very edge at the the branches inside the data center in a DMZ or something like that behind you know um, high end routers and high end firewalls. And then finally, yes, I can optimize into the cloud not only from an SD WAN sense of taking multi -path, multiple paths um, and firing traffic up into AWS or Azure or similar, but also I can um, actually optimize it in a classic sense of TCP optimization, application acceleration, uh, caching and compression, um, which can be very important for uh, long distance runs to infrastructure as a service sites, which are far from, um, let's say, the traditional data center that a Northeast company might have, which might be right down the road. Perfect, perfect. Thank you, Chris. Um, so we're, we're literally right at the top of the hour, 159, so per perfect timing. Thanks. I just want to, for, for um, people that joined the webinar today, we, we, we have a, a lunch and learn schedule. Livia and Chris will also be speaking at that. That's going to be uh, on May 17th from 2 to, um, I'm sorry, from 12 to 2 at the Blackstone Steakhouse um, in Long Island here. So um, you're on the list. You'll get, you'll get the invite for that as well, uh, and uh, we'll do a nice lunch and learn there. So thank you, everyone, for joining today. We really appreciate uh, the time you gave us, and I hope this information was uh, useful to you. Um, have a great day, and we'll talk soon.